You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. First century gospel preaching for the 21st century. Welcome to this another edition of The Ancient Landmark. My name is Jared Jacobs and I'm so thankful to be with you. So thankful we can open up God's Word and spend time together in a study of the Book of God. I want to uh, study uh, this time about the Holy Spirit specifically talking about the sins against the Holy Spirit. Now in other programs and other episodes and studies, we've talked about the Holy Spirit. We've talked about who He is. We've talked about the Holy Spirit's work. We've talked about the gifts, the plural gifts, miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit. We've talked about the singular, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2 and verse 38. We've talked about other aspects of the Holy Spirit and, and what He does and His work in, in inspiration and in, at the creation and in salvation and all, and certainly worthwhile studies. And I want us to continue in, the, in these studies by looking at the sins uh, of our sins against the Holy Spirit or against the Holy Ghost. Folks will commit sins against the Holy Ghost if we're not careful, and so we've got to be watching and be uh, very diligent to make sure that we're not guilty of such a thing. And as we always do, we want to remind you that we're available for Bible studies. If you'd like to study about the Holy Spirit in, in more detail or answering certain questions about the Holy Spirit, we'd love to do that. You just contact us. Uh, we'd love to either have a Bible study with you uh, through, uh, again, through going to your house. You can come to our house. We can have a Bible study via the correspondence course or other things of that nature, you can uh, contact us by calling 683-5386 and we'd love to hear from you and love to discuss those things with you. You can write to us. Uh, the address is 2920 New Hartford Road, Owensboro, Kentucky 42303 and just write us in care of the ancient landmark and I'll get your letter and we'll certainly uh, uh, write back. We'll correspond as we need to. We, uh, as I said, we can set up Bible studies and all those types of things. The website's available also for you at www.southside-churchofchrist.com and going to that website gives you access to past television programs, to sermons, to radio programs, and so many other things that are available to you and for you absolutely free. And again, you can contact us through the email uh, when you go to that website, southside-churchofchrist.com and then just go to the contact us page and contact us link and we will uh, of course get your email and, and correspond in kind. But as we think about the Holy Spirit, we study about uh, this third person of the Godhead, this being, this deity uh, who inhabits the Godhood or the Godhead. Again, we find so many times where folks want to make a very controversial subject out of the Holy Spirit. People are confused about it, and it's very sad that that's the case because as you study about the Holy Spirit, what you find is the Holy Spirit is spoken about from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Basically, you read from lid to lid in the Bible, and you're going to read about the Holy Spirit, about His work, about what He is, has done, and what, for, what He is currently doing for His people. And so what work is being done? We talked about that. The work of the Holy Spirit from the standpoint of, of an indwelling and the direct operation versus indirect operation and all those things. And what we find really as you study the Bible, what we find is that really it's what's the hardest part to do. The hardest part in such a study is not finding material for the study, but rather trying to sort it out and try to put it in pieces and put it in, a, in an order where it is orderly uh, and people can get. And that's really been the hardest part because there's so much material on the Holy Spirit. And I hope this study has been helpful to you. And again, if we want more study on the Holy Spirit, contact us and let's talk about those things. But I made mention of the fact that there are definitely sins against the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying that on purpose. There is a plurality of sins one can commit against the Holy Spirit. It's not just one sin. Perhaps you've heard that. 
Perhaps in times past you have heard the statement made, uh, something akin to the fact that there is a sin against the Holy Spirit, and if you sin against the Holy Spirit, why, well, you'll just never be forgiven. Perhaps you've heard stuff like that. Perhaps you've heard wording or phrases like unforgivable sin, unpardonable sin, and so forth. Perhaps you've heard those things. Well, when we open up the Bible and begin to read and study, what we find is there's not just one sin against the Holy Spirit. There are several sins against the Holy Spirit. And we want to look at some of those and, and just look at them, dig them, dig them apart, look at them, study them out, and make some applications. What is a sin against the Holy Spirit? Well, one thing we find in the book of Acts chapter 7 and verse 51. In Acts 7 and verse 51, when Stephen was there being stoned at this point, uh, being stoned uh, for his preaching and teaching of the gospel, to the people. In Acts 7 verse 51, he said, You stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. What's a sin against the Holy Spirit? One sin against the Holy Spirit is resisting. My friend, do you resist the Holy Spirit? I know the Bible talks about in James chapter 4 to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. We understand what resisting is. It's to shun. It's to get away. It's to, it's to move away. It's to avoid and get away from him. Well, he says you, Acts 751, Stephen said he was talking to people who resisted the Holy Spirit. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be guilty of that. Do you? One who would resist him? How about this one? Uh, as you go in the book of 1 Thessalonians. The book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and there the verses number 19, it's just a very simple statement. He says there, quench not the Holy Spirit. All right, so that's the negative side of it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, to quench not the Holy Spirit. He's saying, don't do something. He's saying, thou shalt not, if you will. So there is a sin involved then, wouldn't there be, if someone tried to quench the Holy Spirit? He says, quench not, don't do it. If I go ahead and do it anyways, was that not a transgression? Yes, it was. And so there's a sin, wasn't it? So there's a sin against the Holy Spirit when you resist. There's a sin against the Holy Spirit when folks try to quench the Holy Spirit in that sense. But another one that's very interesting to me, and I, I would say it this way, in Hebrews chapter 10, and you turn over to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 26, he says, For if we sin willfully, after that we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Verse 28, He that despised Moses' law died without mercy, he says, under two or three witnesses. 29, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye thought he, shall he be thought worthy who has trodden underfoot the Son of God, who has counted the blood wherewith he is sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite to the Spirit of grace. That's Acts, uh, Hebrews 10, verse 29. He's done despite. In other words, you, uh, you know, spite against the Holy Spirit. All right? You have done despite to the Spirit of grace. The things you did were in spite of Him. A spiteful attitude and spiteful actions against the very Holy Spirit Himself. You think that's not a sin? Doing despite to the Spirit of grace is in the same category as trotting underfoot the Son of God and counting the blood wherewith you are sanctified an unholy thing. Now folks, are you ready to call the blood of Christ unholy? If someone calls the blood of Christ unholy, is that a sin or not? Well, you know the answer to that. Doing despite to the Spirit of grace is a sin. And it's a sin against the Holy Spirit. So now we have looked at three sins, haven't we? We've talked about resisting, quenching, and spiting, my word, spiting the Holy Spirit. You've done the spite to the very Spirit of grace. He says, when you sin, he, he tells them it's a sin, when you sin willfully, Hebrews 10, verse 26. So are there sins against the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. Again, in the book of Acts, we were in the book of Acts a moment ago, but go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. And when you turn your attention to Acts 5, 
verse number three and verse number four. You'll notice here that this is the occasion where Ananias and Sapphira were guilty of having property, selling it, and lying about the price of the money. You'll notice in Acts 5, verses 3 and 4, they're not guilty of wrongdoing because they had property. They were not guilty of wrongdoing because they sold it. They were not even guilty of wrongdoing because they gave part of the money instead of all the money. They gave part. Do you realize that giving part of the money was not the sin? The sin was when they gave part and said, lied about it, and said they gave the whole thing. That's where the sin was. If, they, if these folks had come in, spoke to the apostles and said, you know, here is money, or if they said, you know, we had land, we gave part of it, uh, you know, we, we sold it and we're giving you part of the money. If they said something like that, it would have been an issue. If they said something like that, they'd been alive. But they chose to conspire together and while giving part of the money, lie and say this was the entire amount. And when they said that, they were guilty of something. I want you to look at Acts 5.3. What are they guilty of? Well, verse 3 he says, Ananias, why has Satan filled thy heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and keep back part of the price of the land. Verse 4, Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast, uh, why hast thou conceived this thing in thy heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. What happened? He said, you lied to God. He said, when you lied to the Holy Spirit, you've lied to God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is God. But he says this, you've lied to Him. I wonder if you lied to the Holy Spirit if that's a sin. Well, you know it is. Lying to the Holy Spirit, my friends, is a sin. It's sinful. Lying to the Holy Spirit is a sin just as much as any of the other uh, things in this category we've named are sins. Resisting or quenching or uh, doing despite to the Spirit of grace or lying. Yes, all those things. And really, you know, when we come down to it, from earlier studies we found that that whenever you do want something to one part or one person, one being of the Godhead, really you've done it to them all, have you not? Certainly you have. It'd be like this. I, I'll give you an example. If you obey the words of Scripture, are you not obeying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? In other, in other words, the Holy Spirit inspired these words to be written down. The Bible says so. You look over in your Bibles and you're going to see this. That in the book of 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, how that the Holy Spirit said no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. In other words, man didn't make it up himself. The holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Since that's the case and since, Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The words we're reading right now are, are inspired of the Holy Spirit. If I obey this word, I'm obeying the Holy Spirit, right? Sure. Well, am I not also obeying the Father and the Son? Or do I have to do something else to obey the Father and the Son? You know the answer to that. Whenever I do what is laid out here, God, the Father, the author of this Word, Jesus Christ, the one who is the very embodiment of truth, and then here is the Holy Spirit inspiring men to write it down, write, write, write these words down so we can follow it. When we do that, we've obeyed the Godhead. We've obeyed the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, in like manner, if you disobey, if we disobey one, have we not disobeyed all? It's not a matter that someone could disobey God and still be right with the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's not a matter that you could do what the Holy Spirit says and somehow be on the outs with the Father and the Son. It doesn't work that way, does it? When you obey one, you've obeyed all. When you disobey one, you've disobeyed all. So go back through our list. You talk about resisting the Holy Spirit. You talk about uh, quenching the Holy Spirit doing despite the Spirit of grace. You talk about lying to the Holy Spirit and all of that. When you've done that to the Holy Spirit, have you not also done that 
in that sense to the Father and the Son. Whenever you've done one, you have done all, my friend. And so the reason, I, the reason I'm making this statement is because people have the attitude that there is a sin against the Holy Spirit and somehow that is unforgivable and unpardonable and all of that and somehow that's in its own separate category from any other sin. Well, that's not the case. That's just not so. Somebody says, oh, but I've heard of that. They say, oh, now you don't understand, preacher. I've heard about all that stuff, and I know, and I've heard. And my preacher told me, and, and other people told me, that there is some kind of sin, and whenever you commit that sin, it's unpardonable, it's unforgivable. It doesn't matter what you do. You, it's just like you've got a big black mark on you, and you can never be forgiven, never be right. You just, you know, and all that. Really? What, pray tell, is that? Well, there's been a lot of folks give you a lot of different things. And they'll try to tell you, well, it's this subject, it's that, it's something else. Is that really what it is? What is it? What is the unpardonable sin? What is the unforgivable sin? And when you answer that, and you say, oh, this is it. This is the unpardonable sin. And you say, that's the one that if you commit that, if you do that one single time, you can never be forgiven. Then understand what you've said. What you've said is, when that happens, what you've said is that you have said there is a sin that's so wicked, that is so evil, that is so uh, horrible and terrible, that it is more powerful than God. It, the sin is, is greater than the grace of God. Are you ready to admit that? Do you really believe that there is a sin that is so great and a sin that is so heinous and a sin that is so wicked and a sin that is, makes you so guilty that it can actually overpower and actually be greater and stronger than the very grace of God and the love of God and the blood of Christ to forgive it? Are you going to make that kind of statement? Are you going to make that kind of do uh, you believe that? Are you going to listen to someone who has that kind of, a, of an attitude, has that kind of a belief or doctrine that says there's something out there that's greater and stronger and more powerful than the very grace of God and the blood of Christ can't even cleanse it? How about that? Someone says, oh, it's out there. Someone says, yes, that can happen. That's what it is. Well, folks, understand, if that's what it is, if there's something out there that's that powerful, that's that is that, that greater, and is somehow so uh, sinful that no one ever can be forgiven, then it tells us a few things. Yes, it tells us what we said about something greater than God's grace. It tells us that God categorizes sin. You know, whenever I open my Bible, I don't read about categories of sin with God. I read that sin is sin. Sin is a sin against Him, and it's all even. It's all the same. It's all bad, but it's all, there's no categories of good sin, bad sin, greater sin, lesser sin, you know, blacker sin, greater sin, lighter sin. It's not that. Rather, sin is sin. Number two, if you say that there is such a thing as an unpardonable sin, then you're saying that this sin is greater, it's more wicked, it's more dangerous, it's more evil than the persecution and murder of Christians. You know, I read in my Bible that the Apostle Paul was guilty of murdering, he's guilty of persecuting, persecuting Christians, he was guilty of committing them to blaspheme, he's guilty of committing them to do a lot of things. And he says, in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, that I, he says, I received grace. I was forgiven. Even though he considered himself the chief of sinners in so many ways, he said, I was forgiven. And in the book of Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 22, and Acts chapter 26, we read there the conversion of the Apostle Paul and how that Christ said he would forgive him. He was going to forgive them because, of, uh, because he had followed the plan of salvation. He believed on Christ. He repented of his sins and fasting and prayers for three days, he was taken, Acts 22, 16, and baptized, told to be baptized, and wash your sins away. 
Now, so he, though he was guilty of murder, he was guilty of persecuting Christians and all of that, but that's not as bad as this one unforgivable sin, right? And the third thing, if there is such a thing as an unforgivable, unpardonable sin, then what about the very murder of the Messiah? Now you consider that well, my friends. You're telling me that there is a, there is a sin that is so wicked, so evil, so horrible, that it is actually worse than killing, crucifying the Son of God. Is that the kind of thing you want to admit? Is that the kind of thing you want to believe? Or you're going to have someone tell you and, and, and they're going to influence you to believe that there's something more wicked than killing Jesus Christ? And yet my Bible says that whenever the Jews on the day of Pentecost heard about and, and understood, got the reality check of what it meant, the gravity of the situation of murdering the Messiah, they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, Acts 2.38, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He says here that you can repent, you can be baptized, you can be forgiven of sins. And so are we, are we ready to say, are we ready to, to believe a, a doctrine that's going to say, well, yes, you killed the Messiah, but at least you didn't do, you know, that horrible sin you know, at least you didn't do the terrible sin and sin against the Holy Spirit. I mean, all you did was kill Jesus. Really? Is that the kind of position you're ready to take? And yes, I get, I get very excited about it. I get adamant about it, I guess you could say. I get very emotional about it because it just amazes me when I think about folks who have fallen for this, who have fallen for a false doctrine that says there's some kind of unforgivable sin out there that if you commit it one time, you commit this one sin, and one pinpoint, one event of sin, and all of a sudden your whole life, uh, spiritual life, is gone. You are condemned and doomed and damned to hell for eternity because of something you did one time, and you can never, 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 never get forgiveness of it. I don't care how much you repent. Now, is that the kind of thing you're wanting to believe? I'm sorry to say that's the kind of thing that's been thrown around a lot. And that's the kind of thing people have been fooled about. And yet I have shown you already no less than four sins named in the Bible, named sins against the Holy Spirit. Now are all of those unforgivable too? Or do we understand you can be forgiven of them? And you, they can be made, you can be made right before God. And you can repent and you can be right with Him. See, what is it? And so then you come down and we see the consequences. If there is an unforgivable sin, that one pinpoint event in time, that that meant forever and forever you are now uh, doomed to destruction. And so it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to be lost anyways, Right? If that's so, that's worse than killing Jesus. And that's worse than all those others. Yet you see, that's not true. That's not the way that it is. That's not right. That's not so. But what's got to happen is, we need to go back and put things in their context and respect the context of Scripture. Somebody says, now I know there's an unforgivable sin and it's found in Matthew chapter 12. Well, that's where it says, it says there you won't be forgiven. That's in Matthew chapter 12. All right, well, let's turn over there. And we're going to look at that. We're coming up on a break right now and coming up uh, here just in a few minutes. And so I'm not going to be able in this half to give Matthew 12 the attention it deserves. But I'm going to tell you, you stay tuned. And at the end of this break, we'll come back. We're going to have a question. And then after that question, after our break in the question, we'll come back and we're going to start in Matthew chapter 12. And we're going to read from Matthew chapter 12 all that context right in there about the blaspheming of the Holy Spirit and what was going on there. And when we get through, I'm going to assure you, and you'll be assured for yourself, there's, there's no such thing as an unforgivable sin wherein someone can pinpoint the event that took place and that one sin forever then condemned you 
regardless of whether or not you repent, regardless of, of your attitude, regardless of how much you cry out to God or anything else, that some sin is so wicked that God looks at it and He says, I'm sorry, I can't even do anything for that. Do you realize how that just emasculates God and how that takes away God's power? But see, that's not the case. Let's go to the context. Let's learn what Matthew 12 says. And let's look at this situation with the Holy Spirit and the sin that's talked about there. Put it in the context with the other sins. And from that point then, we will understand and know better what's being talked about. And yes, we can avoid sin in our life as well. So you stay tuned and we'll be right back in just a moment. You're watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs. Write to us at 2920 New Hartford Road, Owensboro, Kentucky, 42303. Visit our web address at www.southside-churchofchrist.com. Our Sunday Bible class is at 9.30 a.m. Sunday worship services are at 10.20 a.m. and at 5 p.m. Wednesday night Bible classes are at 7 p.m. Write to us for a free correspondence course. And a free subscription to the Old Pass, our teaching bulletin. Make sure to tune in to our radio program, What is Written, from 12.30 to 1 p.m. Sunday on 94.7 WBIO. And continue to watch The Ancient Landmark airing daily, Monday at 9 p.m., Tuesdays 1.30 p.m., Wednesdays at 5 p.m., Thursdays at 11 p.m., and Friday at 9.30 a.m. Our question at this time comes from the very first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. You look at Genesis chapter 1, we read about the beginning of everything. God speaking this world into existence. And as you read there, that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1 and verse 1. And then he begins to speak about the things that were made and how they were made in, in a day. That the light was made. He called forth the light and separated light from the darkness. And said there the evening and morning were the first day and the second day and so forth. And the question is, just how long did, was that day back then? You know, there's folks today who want to suggest that the day of Genesis 1 could have been years or millions of years or whatever for these things to take place. How, how long was this? Was this really a literal day that's being discussed? Well, whenever you open up your Bibles, you see that, in fact, yes, it is a real literal day. It's not a matter of saying, well, one day meant a million years or a billion years or whatever. It's not that this meant some indeterminate amount, amount of time. Some have said, well, it's, it's comparative to saying like in George Washington's day. Now, we don't mean one day in George Washington's life, but someone says in George Washington's day, it used to be this way. It means during his lifetime, and so this is the idea. No, sir. What he means here is a literal day, a literal 24-hour day. And between day one and day two, down through day six, six days of creation, you have six consecutive literal 24-hour days. The Hebrew word for the word, our English word day is the word yom, Y-O-M, as we would spell it, Y-O-M, and it means a 24-hour day. Not only this, when you look, he says the evening and the morning were the first 
evening and morning, second, third, and so forth. So God even describes, He even defines for us how long this day is. You talk about an evening and a morning, and you had it one day, and the second day, and the third day, and so forth. A third reason why we know that it is just one literal day is when we look into the book of Exodus. And we see now, this is the second book of the Old Testament, you look into the book of Exodus and we see uh, what was compared here. The Bible says in Exodus 20 and verse 9, he says, there God was speaking, six days shalt thou labor and do thy work, but the seventh day, he says, is going to be a Sabbath day. All right? Verse 11 gives you the reason. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, and he rested on the seventh. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Now, notice what he says. Just as God had six days of creation and the seventh day he rested, that just means he stopped working. So also he says you are going to labor for six days. Now, does it mean that does Moses and, and well, literally does God understand what he did? I mean, God is speaking these words from the mountain. You remember that in Exodus chapter 20, the first ten commandments that were given by God were given literally from God's mouth and the people below Mount Sinai heard it. Now, does God know how long he took? I mean, he, he compares the, the normal week of their labor for six days and resting on the seventh and compares that to the creation and says, here's God who worked, who created in six days, rested on the seventh. Now, does he understand what he did or not? Does he know it took six literal days? I mean, if it took six million or six billion years to create the world, what sense does it make to say, well, it took six billion years to get to this point, but I want you to do it in six days? No, it's not. The, that doesn't compare, does it? It does compare when we say God created everything in six literal days and then rested on the seventh. And so he compared that to the Sabbath day of, of Exodus chapter 20. Jesus spoke of it as well when he talked about man and woman being created at the beginning. Matthew 19, verses 4 to 6. Did Jesus understand what God was saying in them? Here he says he, they were created at the beginning. Well, whenever you take a creation week of six literal days and man created on the sixth day, yes, he's created at the beginning, not later on. And so it's not six billion years, six million years, or something like that, but rather it is six literal consecutive days. That's the creation week. We have a very young earth, don't we? Evolution is not true. God's Word is true. He made us in those six days. And we welcome you back to the uh, second half here of our program and of our study of the book of God concerning the Holy Spirit and about specifically the sin against the Holy Spirit. Now, we've already talked about the fact that there were a number of sins that you might commit against the Holy Spirit, and we've also looked from the standpoint of what that means, what's involved if someone would say there is one sin that is an unforgivable sin at that point in time. So, someone says, well, I know that in Matthew 12 it says something about uh, one not being forgiven and all of that. Well, let's just look there. And in fact, you can look in Matthew chapter 12, Mark chapter 3, and Luke chapter 12, for that matter. There's three passages or three texts there that talk about it. Matthew 12, Mark chapter 3, and Luke chapter 12. Now, for our study, we're going to spend the majority of our time in Matthew 12. But you certainly feel free to look at any of those other passages you'd like as well. Mark, Matthew chapter 3 We'll look here and begin reading about verse 22. In verse 22 of Matthew chapter 12, that's where we're going to start. And then we'll, we'll read on down for a little bit. The Bible says that there was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb. In other words, he couldn't see, he couldn't speak. And he healed him, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? When the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow did not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. 24. Now that's key to understanding our context. They said, Jesus was casting out devils by the Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jesus knew their thoughts. Verse 25. 
Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? If by Beelzebub I cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. See what Jesus did to them? They said, well, Jesus is doing this by the power of Beelzebub. Jesus said, well, really, then who, by what power are your children casting out devils? Uh, they'll be your judge. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come unto you. Or else, how can one enter the strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind a strong man and then he spoil the house? It goes on and says in verse 30, He that is not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Therefore, now this is verse 31, Matthew 12, 31. Wherefore I say to you, all manner of sin, he says, uh, that uh, blasphemy shall be forgiven a man. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. Somebody says, there's what I'm talking about. No, 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 wait a minute. Let's keep reading. 32. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man. He says, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever... Uh, speaketh against the Holy Ghost. It shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, nor in the one to come. Either make, verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. Now, that passage, you look at that, and it says, now, Jesus just said that if, you know, you speak against the Son of Man, you'll be forgiven. If you speak to the Holy Ghost, you'll not be forgiven. Well, that is true. That's the statement being made. But here's our problem. What happens is people look at Matthew 12 and verse 31 there and they take that passage out of its context. You see, there's a context to Matthew 12 and there's a context we must respect when we're talking about this. That's why I went back and read from verse 22 all the way up to verse 33. So you get the context. Please understand, Jesus has just cast out a devil. He just cast out a devil out of this man. He, the man could not see. He could not speak. Jesus cast out a devil. He can speak and see. And the people's complaint, the Pharisees' complaint is, he has just cast out a devil by the power of the devil. Now get that, please. That's key to getting that. He has just cast out a devil by the devil. Now, who is speaking that? Who is making that statement? Who is making such an accusation? It's the Pharisees, isn't it? The Pharisees, those people who have been against Jesus for all these years. For the three years of Jesus uh, preaching on this earth, those three years, his primary uh, enemy, if you will, not saying Jesus hated them, but I'm saying they were opposed to Jesus. They were opposed to him. It's the Pharisees, isn't it? And we can talk about Pharisees, Sadducees, priests, and scribes, and Herodians, and so forth, but mainly it's the Pharisees that have such an issue with Jesus. These people come to Jesus and they say, you are guilty because you're casting out demons by the power of the devil. They, can't deny the, they cannot deny that he has this power. They cannot deny that he's cast out a devil. They cannot deny any of the miracles that were done in front of them. But what they say is, you're doing this by the devil's power and not by the power of God. That's key to getting what we're going to study. When Jesus responds to this, and he responds in kind, talking about you speak against me or you speak against the Holy Ghost and so forth, and the blasphemy that takes place, when you talk about that, Please understand who he is talking to. He's not talking to the woman at the well. You see that? John 4. He is not talking to the leprous Samaritan. Jesus in Matthew 12 is not talking to his apostles. He is not talking, he's not speaking to those who through an accident who, I say that from the standpoint of, of an accident, from, saying, from the standpoint of someone who just messes up and they 
they trip up in their life and they, they fall into sin. He's not talking to those people. Right now, he's talking to people who deliberately, uh, who consciously, who uh, with malice or forethought, fight against Jesus, the Pharisees. You see that? And, and the reason I bring this up is because so many times this idea of blaspheming the Holy Spirit or sinning against the Holy Spirit is presented as if one event in time by an otherwise sincere person trying to do the right thing, but then they mess up, and because of that one mess up, then that event in time has made it so that they can never be forgiven. Folks, that's false doctrine. And that's not what Jesus was talking about, and that's not who Jesus was talking to. He was talking to people who were fighting against him and, and, and uh, purposely trying to trip him up, trying to deny his word and will. They're, they are fighting him at every step. They are denying him at every step. They're trying to turn the thoughts, they're trying to turn the people, all those followers, they're trying to turn them against Jesus. That's who he's talking to. Get it. That's very important. Because he says, it's to these people who call Jesus an imposter. It's to these people who said he had the power of the devil. It's to these people who have fought Jesus tooth and toenail all this time. It's to these people that he's speaking in Matthew 12. Get that. Because if I don't understand the context of this, that's what's led to all sorts of false doctrines and what's led to all sorts of problems and all sorts of false ideas about what sin can be forgiven and what sin is not forgiven and so forth. It's, he's talking to them. He's not talking to the woman at the well who would listen to him. He's not talking to the leprous Samaritan who went back and thanked Jesus for healing him. He's not talking to those, that type of a person. He's not talking to someone with that, that, that spiritual aspect. He's talking to people who fight, fighting and opposing. He says in verse 30, He that's not with me is against me. He that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. You're not with me, you're against me. Make no mistake about it. He goes on and says, Therefore, all manner of blasphemy. He talks about this blasphemy here. That, that men shall speak. He said, now if it's a blasphemy here, he says, if you speak against the Holy Spirit, it's not going to be forgiven you. Now, what does the word blasphemy mean? The word blasphemy means just what Jesus said here. It means to speak against. It means to speak against. It means to fight against. It means to stand opposed to Him. Oftentimes, we think of, a blas uh, we think of blasphemy as a statement, as words used. You can blaspheme Jesus with actions just as easily. But it's to be opposed and to speak against, to slander Him. And again, it's not limited to words. It can, be limit, it can also include your deeds as well. But that's what's going on. And so what we find is, and, and what's interesting is, uh, uh, Albert Bengal back years ago wrote a commentary about Matthew 12 and, and talked about this and this blasphemy uh, situation. And he makes the same point I'm trying to make. Because Mr. Bingle said in his commentary that it's not a particular act of sin, but it is a willful, determined opposition to the Holy Spirit. That's where the problem is. And that's where it is. And that's why I was so emphatic in the first part of our study. Because please don't think it's one particular act of a sin at one point, one event in time. Because it's not. If that was the case, I could give you four more that are just as wicked. See that? Four more that are just as bad. But as you lay these out, it's the willful opposition. It is a determined mental uh, attitude. It's a determined thing. Your motivation is such that you're opposed to Jesus Christ. You're opposed to the Holy Spirit and to His words. So He says, Jesus said, now if you blaspheme, if you're opposed to me, like you Pharisees are, that's the point. 
You're opposed to me like the Pharisees are. He said, now you'll have a chance. You can be forgiven. But if you stand opposed to the Holy Spirit, if you stand opposed to Him, then there is no forgiveness, not in this world nor the one to come. Uh, other versions have it this age. Technically, that's, that's a better term. Not in this age, nor in the one to come. Well, what's he talking about? This age and the one to come. Is he talking about on earth and heaven? Or, I mean, what, what's going on? No, it's not the age of the earth and then the age in heaven. He's talking about this age, this time period. Remember that the, the Bible itself can be divided into basically three time periods. There is the patriarchal period, there is the mosaic time period, and the Christian time period, the Christian age, gospel age, some say. And so you had the patriarch times from uh, Genesis 1 uh, up to the days of Exodus chapter 20, with the Jews at least. Then you have the Mosaic time period with the Jewish people going from uh, Mount Sinai and Moses and all of that and going all the way up to, including this time period with Jesus, because Jesus kept the law, you remember. And so up to this time to the cross, and then the gospel age starts there in the book of Acts and it continues to this good hour. And so that's the gospel age of the Christian age. So Jesus, understanding that the Mosaic time period is about over with because he's going to the cross, he says, if you deny the Holy Spirit, if you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, he said, there's no forgiveness, not in this age, nor the age to come. In other words, the time period in which Christ is, has already died on the cross. Christ has ascended back to His Father. The Holy Spirit has come upon the apostles. And now they're in that gospel age. But if you still deny, and you still deny the words and the, and the teaching, you still blaspheme and slander the Holy Spirit, He says, then there's no forgiveness there. And that's what's going on. That's what's happening. See, this age has to do with the Mosaic age or the gospel age. From this age or the one to come. Now, why say this? Somebody says, well, it still sounds to me like there's an unforgivable sin. Well, please understand, it's not an unforgivable sin, one event of sin, but he's talking about an attitude that folks have where they are opposed to the Holy Spirit. So yes, it is sin, but it's not one event, one pinpoint event in time of sin, and that's it. It's a lifetime. It's a state of mind. It's a state of will. It's a lifetime wherein you have stood opposed to the Holy Spirit all of this time and die that way. Jesus said to the Pharisees, you can deny the Holy Spirit. You'll not be forgiven. Why? Well, remember what the Holy Spirit has done. Now think about it. What has the Holy Spirit done? We've already studied on this in earlier studies. The Holy Spirit had His work in creation and in salvation, but also in revelation or inspiration, inspiring the very words that we're reading right now. So if you stand to, to deny, you stand to slander, to be opposed to the Holy Spirit and do His work, in essence, you could just take this Bible and you can just throw it out the window because you've just been opposed to the very Holy Spirit's words. And if you throw away the, the book, where is salvation going to be found? See, that's the point. There's no other salvation that's to be found except in the gospel, Romans 1.16. And if there's no salvation except what's in the gospel, well, you can't deny that. Well, you can't deny the author of it. See that? You can't deny the one who inspired these men to write down what they did. But if you deny and you oppose and you slander the very one who inspired these words then how is there any salvation there? There's not. And so that's why Jesus was saying what he did. He said, now you may oppose me personally. And they were, he said, you may oppose me personally, and that's one thing, but if you oppose the Holy Spirit and you slander the Holy Spirit and you speak against him, there's no salvation, there's no forgiveness there. 
Not in this age or in the one to come. Because once you've done that, you've essentially taken the Bible and thrown it away. Haven't you? Now how are you going to have salvation when you threw the Bible out? That's the point. And that's why I was emphatic. It's not a one pinpoint time, one sin somebody committed and you can mark it on the calendar when they committed it. They never did it again, but they did it that one time and then that made them unforgivable. No! It's an attitude, state of mind. It's a life decision someone has made where they stand opposed to Him. The Pharisees stood opposed to Jesus Christ. And it wasn't one pinpointed time in life. It was their mission and their work to deny the Lord, to oppose Him, to get people to think He was an imposter and so forth. But you deny what the Holy Spirit says. You're in the worst shape even then. See that? And that's why I say it's a lifelong thing. It's a, it's a mission that one has in life to deny. See? Why say that? Well, because the Holy Spirit has the final say in Revelation. In this Revelation. The revelation of God's will. It's here. Someone opposes that. Someone stands against it. You revile against it. You slander the Holy Spirit. Where are you going to go? To whom will you turn then? Because this is it. That's all. This is all you got. Where are you going to go now? See, that's what that blaspheming is about. That's what that slandering is about. And so, when you look, you find really a number of sins, plural sins, against the Holy Spirit. Whether it was lying to Him, or doing despite the Spirit of grace, or you've uh, quenched the Holy Spirit and said, don't do that, and you tried to, and, you know, on and on. Resisted Him. You've resisted Him. That's what's happening here. It's a similar situation here. In the book of Hebrews chapter 6, in verses 4 through 6, it's a similar description, if you will, similar statements being made at that time. In Hebrews chapter 6, in verses 4 to 6, where here he discusses folk who have denied the Lord and who have, who have turned away from Him. He says, It's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, have tasted the good word of God and the power of the world to come, if they shall fall away, to renew them again in repentance, seeing they crucify themselves the Son of God afresh, and put Him to an open shame. Well, it's the same idea. Someone says, well, there you go. It says it's impossible to renew them. Yes, well, then what are we going to do with someone like Simon the sorcerer, who, after he sinned, he repented, and he was forgiven? What are we going to do with 1 John chapter 1? And verse uh, 7 through 9 where it talks about that if we confess our sins, we, talk, and John includes himself, he's including Christians, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Does the Bible contradict itself now? No. There's no way. The Bible never contradicts itself. Here's the point. The point is the fella in 1 John was someone who was ready to repent and he turned away from those sins and God forgave him. That Christian, that child of God, repented, he turned away from those sins and he, God was ready to forgive him. In this case, in Hebrews 6, is somebody who won't do that. He has rejected the covenant, he has rejected God, and he says someone who's turned away from him like that, you can't bring him back. It's impossible to renew someone to repentance when they won't return. Just like the fellow who has made it his mission to deny and oppose and stand against and blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you're not going to be forgiven of sins. Any sin. And that, because you've turned away from your only source of salvation. Hebrews 6, you've turned away from your only source of salvation. Keep going. Hebrews chapter 10. We read that a moment ago. Read it again. If we sin willfully after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. But a certain fearful looking for judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversary. 
What have we done? He said, if you sin willfully after you've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no more sacrifice. You can't turn anywhere else. If you sin willfully and you turn away from God and you turn away from His Word, you have no other recourse. You have no other outlet in life and anywhere that you're going to be forgiven of sins because you turned away from the only source of forgiveness. Now, under Moses' law, he said, man died under two or three witnesses for those kinds of things. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye thought he to be worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, who hath come the blood wherewith he sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite to the Spirit of grace. You spite the Spirit of grace? You have trodden underfoot the Son of God, counted his blood unholy? That sounds pretty unforgivable to me, doesn't it? Yet, my friends, that sounds pretty unforgivable. Why is it unforgivable? It's unforgivable because you did not repent. Because you did not turn away. Now you go back to Matthew chapter 12 and you see folks intent, bent on calling Jesus an imposter, calling him the devil, turning people away from him, trying to deny his very miracles, trying to say he's a devil. That doesn't sound like a very penitent person. Does it to you? That don't sound penitent to me. Doesn't sound like someone's ready to turn to the Lord and ready to make their life right, is it? The exact opposite of a woman at the well. The exact opposite of a leprous man. The exact opposite of Nicodemus and some of those other folks we could talk about. Whenever you're ready to repent of your sins and you're ready to turn away and you're going to truly follow the Lord and believe Him and follow His will, be baptized for the remission of your sins and all of that, you can be forgiven. If you're a Christian and you turned away from God, there's no more sacrifice for sin. But if you as a Christian will repent, Acts 8, 22, you will come back to Him, you will confess those wrongs, 1 John 1, 9, and you will be right in the sight of God, you can be forgiven. You can do it, but it demands your acceptance of the Holy Spirit's words, the acceptance of His word and His will, the acceptance of those things, and the obedience to it that brings about that forgiveness. But so long as one is bent on doing what they will, see, we have issues. You see, someone who blasphemed the Holy Spirit has rejected heaven's last appeal to save man. They have rejected the power of God. They have not only done that, but rejected God's power to save us. They've done all those things. They have just, I mean, how could you convince anyone if they've rejected all of that? Folks, that's what we're talking about. The truth is, any sin is unforgivable when you will not repent. When you're bent and bound and determined, you're going to live that life of sin. That's unforgivable. What can be made forgivable, what is forgiven, is whenever you come out of that, when you repent of that, and you do what's right. You follow the Lord's plan of salvation like we've talked about, and you believe on Christ, you repent of your sins, you're baptized, you're forgiven. I don't care what sin you've done. You repent of it, the Lord will forgive you. The Lord is not weak, and He is someone who can forgive each and every sin. That's a fact. When you come to Him in repentance and you believe on Him and you're baptized, you can be forgiven. Someone who's a Christian is turned away, you can come back. You repent of it, you're forgiven. That's the truth. Folks, there's hope for you and there's help for you if we will just listen and follow what the Lord Jesus has to say. I'm so thankful for this time and so thankful for our study. Thankful that you stayed with us. And until next time, Lord willing, we'll bid you good day. You have been watching The Ancient Landmark with Jared Jacobs, first century gospel preaching for the 21st century. Tune in Monday through Friday for an in-depth study of God's Word. The Ancient Landmark has been brought to you by Southside Church of Christ.